Hello, my name is Thomas Dietrich, and I'm a professor emeritus at Oregon State University. Uh, and my uh, research career has been devoted to machine learning in very different, many different uh, applications and, uh, and theoretical settings. And today I'm uh, very honored to have the chance to talk to you about anomaly detection and some of the work that I and other people have been doing in this, in this area. Uh, I want to start out by thanking uh, Dan Hendricks, who was an intern with me, and Balaji Lakshman Ryan, who is at Google and was a, a master's student at Oregon State, uh, for their advice and suggestions in putting together this presentation. So uh, my motivation for studying uh, anomaly detection and related techniques was a project I was doing about 20 years ago uh, that involved the automated counting of freshwater macroinvertebrates. So macroinvertebrates just means large bugs uh, that live in freshwater streams. And the uh, US Environmental Protection Agency every year does a randomized sampling of freshwater streams and rivers in the United States to assess their health. And uh, this is done by taking what's called a kick net, which you can see here on the right. Uh, and you basically kick the, the, the sort of stuff on the bottom of the stream into the net. And you're capturing these uh, insects that live uh, most of their lives as in a larval stage underwater. They have gills and so on. Um, they only come out of the water to mate at the very end of their lives. And, uh, and so the idea, the, 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 the challenge with this from an application point of view is that uh, they collect these samples and then someone has to uh, identify them down to at least the genus level and ideally to the species level. And that requires very specialized expertise and it's very time consuming. And so we had the thought, well, could we make a, a robotic apparatus that you could take the sample, dump it in, it would uh, separate out each insect, photograph it under standardized conditions, and then we would use computer vision to identify it. And uh, this was in the pre-deep learning days. We, uh, our, our collaborators collected 100 specimens of each of 54 classes. So not a huge data set by any means. Um, and our classifier was getting something like 90% accuracy. And you can see we published at uh, CBPR and so on. Um, and so uh, we, I was quite happy with this until we realized that, well, actually there are uh, going to be other things in our field uh, samples besides these 54 classes of, of insects. In fact, there are 76,000 species of freshwater insects worldwide and there are 1,200 species in the United States. Uh, and beyond bugs, the field samples, uh, because they're being processed by a robotic system, might also contain small rocks or leaves or bits of plastic, things like this. And so we did a, just a simple estimate of equal error rate just based on insects, leaving out some of the insects, and found that our equal error rate was something like 20%. So we were failing to identify 20% of of species that did belong to R54, and we were um, uh, also uh, falsely classifying other stuff, we call them the aliens, um, as belonging, 20% of them as belonging to R54 classes. So this is known, of course, as the open category problem or the open set problem, that when you take a classifier and apply it in the wild, you may encounter classes of, of objects or whatever that you did not see during training. Uh, and so the, this arises in any application, uh, like novel obstacles encountered by a self-driving car, uh, as we saw with uh, uh, Sweden's uh, uh, Volvo uh, uh, self-driving cars when they tested them in Australia, had not been trained on kangaroos and were surprised by them. Novel diseases in medical imaging, novel products in online marketplaces, and novel cyber attacks at pretty much everywhere. And so the, the, the claim that I, that I want to make is that every deployed machine learning classifier should include a competence model that, uh, that captures somehow the domain of competence or, or region of competence of the classifier. And uh, the, uh, that, so then the question is, well, how to build such a thing? And the strategy that we've been pursuing uh, in, in the research community is 
primarily to think of this as an anomaly detection problem. Does this new query, which I'll call XQ here in this diagram, does this uh, uh, look like it is a, a, a query that the classifier, which is down here, is competent to, to classify? And so we're going to get some sort of a competence score or an anomaly score. And if the competence score is high enough or, uh, or the anomaly score is low, then we want to reject this, uh, this case. In our case with the robot, we wanted it to, to send the, uh, the problematic uh, specimens into a separate bin for the human expert to handle. But if the classifier is competent enough, then we can go ahead and just run the classifier. So this is a, a version of classification with the rejection option, but the reject option here is due to it being an anomaly. Now, in some applications, you can you also don't uh, you don't need to uh, process single queries at a time. You could uh, batch them up and look at the batch statistics, uh, and then it becomes more of a change detection problem to to detect that there there's a different distribution in this data set than you were trained on. But I won't be discussing change detection any further here today. Okay, so how do we define anomaly detection formally? Um, in the literature, people kind of, uh, th there's been a lack of precision. Um, and the definition that we have uh, settled on is that an anomaly is a data point that was generated by a process that is different than the process that's generating the nominal data. So we'll talk about nominal, nominals being the known uh, categories of objects and anomalies uh, or aliens being the, the new categories. So we're going to look at two uh, setups. One is where the tr we've given unlabeled data in both cases. So we're given capital N unlabeled training examples. And in uh, the first case, uh, all of the data come from the nominal distribution, which we'll call D naught. And uh, so this is the clean data case. In the second case, the data come from a mixture of the nominal and the anomaly distributions. Uh, and so we have contaminated training data. Um, and this is uh, typically happens, for instance, in uh, financial fraud detection or cybersecurity, where you you just cannot be sure that you have a clean data set. But hopefully, the um, the frequency of anomalies is small. Uh, in and so we'll call the anomaly distribution DA. And then we're going to be given test data uh, from a mixture of the two distributions. And our goal is to find the data points in the test data that belong to the anomaly distribution. Of course, we might also want to use this to clean the, the training data, and, and that would be a separate application. Now, one uh, important note is that uh, in some applications or deployments, the anomalies are not coming from a stationary distribution. So if we think about uh, cybersecurity or financial fraud, um, that we, we have an adversary, and they will be adapting. And so it would be a mistake to assume that the anomalies come from a stationary distribution. Uh, we, we will assume uh, that, that the, the nominal distribution is stationary, um, and that suffers from all of the, the problems in general in machine learning that, that, uh, that after deployment we will need to adapt to, to change in distributions, even over our known classes. Okay, so in the literature there are two problem formulations. One is known as the OOD problem and the other, the open category problem. And uh, the, the main difference is in the evaluation methodology because the setup is basically the same. We assume that we're given N training examples from D naught. They belong to one of K classes. And the testing data is a mixture, DM, of the D naught and the DA, so the nominals and the anomalies. But, uh, but, but in, the, in this setup, the anomalous points are coming from a different data set. So uh, whereas in the open category case, what we usually do is we're going to set aside out of the total of K classes, we might train on a subset of them and use the remaining classes to be the, uh, to stand in for our novel classes, our alien categories. Um, and then and uh, the rest of it is the same. Given a query XQ, we want to decide, really just make the Boolean decision, does it belong to DA or D naught? And if it's from DA, then we want to reject it, else we want to classify it. And so, uh, as I say, the difference is the evaluation protocol. So the typical setup for out of distribution is we train on data from domain A and we test from a mix of A and B. And so we might train on MNIST and test on a mix of MNIST and fashion MNIST. 
whereas in the open category or novel category setting, we uh, will will hold out, say, the digits six through zero, and we'll just train on digits one through five and then test on all 10 digits. Okay, well, what metrics do we use to evaluate these? Well, the typical one is the area under the ROC curve for this binary decision. Um, uh, and of course, uh, this is a favorite in machine learning, but perhaps not as relevant to this problem, to, to this kind of problem uh, as other metrics. So uh, other ones that people have looked at is looking at the correct detection rate at a fixed false alarm rate. So if you have a problem where false alarms, that is false, to, that false uh, claims that it's an alien, that those are very expensive, then what you want to do is control your false alarm rate and then maximize your true positive rate, uh, maximize your detection of these aliens subject to that constraint. Conversely, in uh, kind of AI safety type applications like a self-driving car or something, um, we're more concerned about the missed alarm rate. So we want to uh, ensure that, say, we're getting a 95% true positive rate and only missing 5% of the aliens. Uh, and then subject to that, we want to minimize our false alarm rate. Okay, well, uh, in, it's my view that the out of distribution detection setting is usually easier than the novel category setting. Because when you pull data from a different data set, uh, there may be very simple global image statistics that can tell you which data set the data point came from. Um, and uh, so, so uh, whereas in the novel, novel category protocol, uh, the data have typically all been collected by the same methods and involve very similar objects. So there aren't cues from lighting or object size or viewpoint, things like this, that, uh, that can, can uh, give you uh, 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 an uh, unrealistic advantage. Um, I also don't think that the out of distribution case corresponds to a real world case. If you trained on MNIST for postal code recognition, you aren't likely to suddenly be given fashion MNIST images. But, uh, but obviously there are situations where the lighting, the camera and so on have changed from your training data. Um, and and this, this could be like in the OD case. But the OD case is easier to study because you can download someone's pre-trained network and apply your technique on top of it and evaluate. And so it's been, I'd say, much more popular in the, in the research literature. But I think the novel category case, of course, at least for my real world use case, is the one I care about. So in the remainder of this presentation, what I want to do is first uh, review the main, uh, I guess, theoretical approaches to anomaly detection and give a little, little explanation of each. So that will have a bit of a tutorial flavor to it. And then I want to uh, try to review recent research on deep anomaly detection and talk about the struggles that we're having trying to get anomaly detection to work in deep learning things. And then I finally wrap up with some work out of my own group on how to set the anomaly detection threshold for that last case where we want to uh, try to control the missed alarm rate and make it as small as possible. How do we set our threshold to achieve that when we don't have any labeled training data for the anomaly? Okay, well, there are basically four uh, theoretical methods, uh, approaches that I think uh, cover most of the literature. I think absolutely fundamental is the idea that we need some representation in which we can measure distances. And so a, a classic thing that's been used in featureized data sets is to just say, let's take the, uh, the, the distance from the query to the uh, nearest neighbor in the training data or the nearest K neighbors or something like this, right? And that can give us our anomaly score. On top of that, we could layer density estimation methods. But density estimation still basically assumes that underlying it, there is some uh, notion of, of neighborhoods and nearness. But then we can use uh, perhaps a, a better uh, signal, which is the, the surprisal, uh, right? Which is the minus log probability. The idea being that if something has a very low probability, then its negative log will be very high. So we, we're, and we will be infinitely surprised if something of probability zero is observed. Uh, whereas if something has probability one, we'll have a surprise of, of zero. And so this leads us to wanting to model the joint distribution of the input space. Um, some people have criticized the density estimation approach as saying, well, you're, you're having to solve a more difficult problem than you need to solve. And maybe we should listen to Vladimir Vapnik, who says, don't do that. 
uh, think about the, the precisely the problem you need to solve, which might be to find a, uh, a decision boundary around your training data that contains one minus alpha of the training data and then use your anomaly score to be essentially your distance from that decision boundary uh, outside of it. And then, uh, so all three of those are basically trying to get a, a grasp on how similar the input data point is to the training data and measuring that by some notion of distance and density. The, the fourth technique is quite different, I think. The goal here is, uh, is to try to set up a problem in which the, the machine learning system will fail when it's given new data points. In particular, uh, typically we train some kind of an autoencoder to reconstruct the input given, given the input, right? So we, we, we learn an encoder and a decoder, and given X, we encode it into typically a bottleneck, of course, but it has some kind of re representational constraints, then decode it back to try to get the original image back. And we want to do this in such a way that on uh, uh, queries that belong to outside of the training data, there will be a high reconstruction error so that the, it's not competent to reconstruct those points. And we use our reconstruction error as our anomaly source. Okay, well, just to go into these a little bit more, um, let's think about the, the sort of requirements for each one. So if we're going to use distance-based methods, we need a good distance metric. And this means also that we're assuming that all all of the input dimensions are, are equally relevant. And of course, we might explore weighted distance metrics and so on, but we have to keep in mind we have no supervised data for training those metrics. Uh, so doing feature selection and metric learning is, is quite a challenge with uh, for distance-based methods. For density estimation, we have this challenge of, of doing density estimation potentially in a high dimensional space. Uh, and we know that that's quite challenging. Um, and, and I wanted to do a particular dive here on uh, deep uh, density estimation because uh, many of us got very excited when uh, these uh, ideas of, of uh, autoregressive flows were first developed as a way of doing deep density estimation. Because of course, almost all machine learning problems could be solved if we could uh, achieve deep density estimation and, and conditional density estimation. So um, for those of you who haven't seen these techniques, the idea is to transform some known distribution, for example, a multivariate Gaussian, into a target distribution that has high likelihood on our training data. So typically, we would, we would start with some uh, multivariate Gaussian here and then push it through a, a, a chain of functions uh, such that um, uh, coming out of this, these transformed values uh, are distributed according to uh, the target probability distribution. And obviously we have a sample from that distribution and we want to maximize the likelihood of the data uh, for that sample. And we'll call the whole function capital F here and say that it's parameterized by theta. Now, uh, we would like F to be invertible uh, because then the idea is that uh, to, to compute the, uh, given a, a query XQ to compute its density, we can run F backwards and measure its density under the Gaussian here. And, and, and that, that would be a very easy thing to do. And of course, the constraint is that we must preserve the probabilities of events. Um, so uh, if, we, if, we, if we have a, a probability density uh, P of X, um, uh, an event is going to be a region and its probability mass will be you know, integrating that, that density, that measure over that region. Uh, and so we need to ensure that any region in the input space, the corresponding integral in Z space, at least maybe for small regions, is, uh, gives the same answer. Um, and one way to achieve that is with the change of variables formula. So uh, we, if, if we uh, uh, calculate the determinant of the Jacobian of, of F inverse uh, and, and use that to multiply the Gaussian by this, then, uh, then, then we, we will know that the resulting function is a density. Uh, and this compensates for any stretching or compression of the space, at least uh, point-wise. OK, so um, the main techniques that have been used for constructing deep density models are to is to ensure that each a little f in that chain is invertible and has an easy to compute Jacobian. And uh, just as an example, uh, uh, masked autoregressive flow, or MAF, 
by Papa Macarios and colleagues that came out in 2017 uh, uh, uses uh, basically an autoregressive function, right? So it, it, uh, if we're talking about images, it builds a, a, a function of the first pixel and then a function that, that predicts the second pixel given the first and the third pixel given the first and the second and so on. So a sort of triangular shape, uh, um, which is what the masking refers to. Um, and, uh, and they give this example um, where they want, where the true density looked like this and they fit a masked autoregressive flow that has a certain number of layers in it. Um, and they didn't get a very good fit. Um, and the distribution of the Z values was clearly not Gaussian. So then they stack several of these networks together. Um, so this is a stack of five MAFs. And you can see that now they've got a very good fit between the true density and this fitted density. And the, the Z values that, that are coming out of F inverse are uh, very nicely uh, uh, two-dimensional Gaussian. And they have uh, experiments showing that comparing uh, a few against real MVP, which is another very nice method, um, and showing that uh, they were generally getting better holdout uh, log likelihoods. Um, now there was an important paper, I think, last year at ICML by Priyank Kobizel, Yu, and Brubaker. And they, they uh, proved that if you're using a Gaussian as your source distribution, then you are re restricted in the kinds of tails you can fit. So you can't fit arbitrary probability distributions, only ones that have uh, basically uh, exponential tails. So if you're fitting to something that has heavier tails, they suggest that you might want to use a student T distribution as your source distribution that you transform. Okay, but then uh, I think a very insightful paper was published uh, late last year uh, by Lilan and Din uh, uh, with the title, Perfect Density Models Cannot Guarantee Anomaly Detection. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, here's a kind of my translation of their argument. They, they make many good points in the paper and I, I recommend it very highly. But, um, you know, we want to use minus log P as our anomaly score. And we usually use just the density. We plug in the density here rather than computing an, an event. Whereas strictly speaking, surprisal only applies to probability mass. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, uh, a single point in the density has zero mass. So a solution, of course, would be to consider a region surrounding our query, uh, say a ball of radius rho. Um, and, uh, and then we would want to know the probability that X belongs to that ball. And we could do that by integrating the density, obviously. Um, so when we're using the density instead of the event, we're basically assuming that the density to X is a good approximation of the, of the event. Um, and basically sort of a piecewise uh, flat uh, assumption. But it turns out this assumption is broken in most of these deep density models because the invertible flow that we create between the initial distribution and, uh, and our uh, output uh, warps the space, changes the distance between points, so that the local density can be very different uh, in the transform space than it is back in our original multivariate Gaussian. And so, uh, uh, the, and, and so this is the key thing, that, that the very thing that gives us power, which is this ability to create this very distorted um, transform space is distorting and transforming uh, a sensible neighborhood in the multivariate Gaussian into some very strangely shaped thing. I just drew this by hand, but you can imagine it's been stretched and twisted and so on um, in an invertible way, but still could be a very complex transformation. And so, uh, uh, you know, since density is really, um, uh, we want to use it for anomaly detection to detect a region of the space that is that has very few data points in it. Unfortunately, after transformation, uh, that, may, that may not correspond to a nice compact region. Um, and so, uh, so this may explain why people have not had very good luck trying to do uh, uh, use deep density estimation for anomaly detection. So the, I think the lesson is that the representational space matters. The distance function that we are that we're getting in that space is critically important. You really can't do density estimation without assuming some notion of distance. So we really want to do our density estimation in a meaningful space. And when we think about it, actually doing it in the pixel space of the original images doesn't make any sense at all. We know that's not 
the semantically interesting space. Um, and, uh, and of course, we want to avoid having to do integrations. Uh, uh, so we want to learn a good latent space in which images of similar contents are close together. And so uh, distance is sensible there. And then perhaps doing deep density estimation in that space would make sense. And people have had success with that approach. OK, so the third approach, uh, back to the main narrative, is quantile methods. Um, and again, uh, the famous techniques here are the one class support vector machine or support vector data description, which draw a boundary around, uh, say, 99% of the data points. And there are deep extensions of this. Lucas Ruff's PhD dissertation was about deep SVDD. Um, in our experience, this method is uh, somewhat tricky to work with um, it, because the idea is that you're going to transform your input space into a space where you'll be able to draw a hypersphere around say 95% of the data points. Um, but if you're not careful, it just maps everything to the origin. And then it's, of course, really easy to draw a hypersphere around it, but really meaningless also. So they have a couple of tricks. Uh, they initialize their, their neural network that's going to trans do this transformation and then um, push all the points through it and calculate the mean of those points in the uh, latent space before doing any learning at all. And they constrain the hypersphere to be there. And they also have shown that they need to have no bias weights in, in this network uh, because that's another source of collapse. OK, well, the last, uh, the last uh, main method right, uh, that, I, that I was mentioning before is reconstruction methods. And I want to take us back now 23 years to uh, when Dean Pomerleau was a PhD student at CMU. And they were working on the first self-driving, or at least uh, self-steering lane keeping uh, car, which was a van that had to be big enough to carry a bunch of big workstations in the back. Uh, and they were using a neural network with this structure. Uh, there was a, a forward-looking camera that produced a 30 by 32 pixel uh, image. That went down to four hidden units and then up to 30 hidden units that were encoding the steering angle to be used. And then also from those same four hidden units, there was a, a decoder that was seeking to reconstruct the original image. Basically, this was an autoencoder through a very tight bottleneck of four hidden units. And, uh, and what they did was continuously monitor the reconstruction error. And if the reconstruction error uh, dropped, then they would not trust the steering out, uh, output. And, uh, and the argument was, well, uh, they're both the steering and the reconstruction are using the same four hidden unit values. And so if one is bad, the other is probably bad too. But of course, the beauty of reconstruction is that it's self-supervised, so we can detect immediately that we have a problem. So the principle of this, uh, I call it an anomaly detection through failure, is to try to create a task in which the learned system should fail outside of the training data. So we don't want it to generalize at all. A challenge with autoencoders these days with deep learning is that they can be too good. They can actually learn to be very good image compression systems. And so they work well on all images, uh, including ones outside the training uh, data set. Um, OK, uh, I think I already said all of this. Um, I guess another weakness is that um, it's not obvious that using, say, a squared pixel level reconstruction error is the right thing to use, um, it, because it really doesn't capture the semantics of image similarity. And people also find that training these is difficult. Although variational autoencoders have made it easier, it's still uh, quite hard. And as I say, it's hard to prevent an autoencoder from becoming a general image compression algorithm. OK, well, now let's move on to deep anomaly detection for classifiers. So um, the, the you know, beauty of deep learning is that we learn a representation um, uh, instead of having to hand engineer it. Um, but uh, uh, let's say it, it, man, we're, but it's, it's a representation that is really sufficient for the particular task that we're training it to perform. So in, this, in the case of classification, this means the representation is good at separating the labeled training data by class but it doesn't necessarily provide a good representation for detecting anomalies. And so uh, let's, let's look at four different representational learning uh, approaches that have been used in trying to do deep anomaly detection. The first is just training a supervised classifier. So we could use a standard thing like, uh, like this uh, simple CNN. Um, and of course, uh, we treat the backbone as an encoder that produces a latent representation. 
And from there, there's a fully connected network that produces the logits, and those go into a softmax to give us our probabilities. So uh, the idea for an anomaly score would be to, um, to use the, uh, the, for instance, the maximum of these logits or the, the, uh, the confidence, which is one minus the maximum of the predicted probabilities, to use that as our anomaly score. My student, Alex Geyer, has been doing a study to try to understand what is happening in the representation during supervised classification. So what he did was to take a dense net and train it on six known classes from the CIFAR-10 image data set, uh, holding out four novel classes to be our anomaly classes. And then he took all the intermediate, or all the uh, latent activations throughout the entire training process and did one big UMAP visualization of them. So we can see here in the, in the uh, before uh, learning begins, uh, the images have all been mapped to just a few number of locations, a small number of locations here in the latent space. So these light green points are the anomaly classes and each of the, uh, the known classes has a different darker shade of green. And so now we'll space through the epics and you can see that points are being pulled out from the center uh, uh, to form these kind of chains that then coalesce into clusters. And this is the, the sort of final arrangement of the, of the learning. And we can see that, uh, that each of the six known classes has formed up a pretty nice cluster. Maybe it's a little spread out in some cases. Um, but the uh, unfortunate thing is that the four unknown classes have not formed up any, any recognizable cluster structure. Instead, they, they're still mostly occupying the sort of center of the space, although some of them have been pulled out and are, must, must be confused with with points that belong to these classes. So, um, so from a distance function, a distance metric learning perspective, doing supervised classification with softmax as our loss function um, is, uh, is giving us uh, good distances uh, within and between clusters of the training classes, exactly as we would expect. But it's not so good at giving us distance measures between the anomalies uh, and, uh, and other anomalies. Um, and also between the anomalies and the known classes. So um, when, we, when we've trained up a classifier, we generally use one of these three anomaly scores, either the entropy of the predicted probabilities or one minus the maximum of the predicted probabilities, which we could think of as a kind of uh, one, uh, the one minus the confidence, um, or uh, the negative of the maximum logit uh, uh, before it goes through the softmax. Um, we find this is actually the best of the of these measures, but they all perform quite similarly. Uh, so my student Rishit Garapali uh, did a headroom analysis asking how well do existing anomaly scoring methods extract the anomaly information that is captured in the latent representation of the learned network. And our approach was to compare that to an Oracle anomaly detector that was trained using labeled anomalies um, with that representation. And then the second question was, how well could any network with this architecture perform? And to do that, we would train, say, on all 10 CIFAR classes and then see how well the anomaly score uh, could compute the, the, the anomalous uh, classes. So we did this on CIFAR 10 with a six known and four unknown split, or CIFAR 100 with an 80 known and 20 uh, uh, unknown split. We're using AUC as our main measure and a ResNet 34 as the backbone. So um, the results are shown here. Uh, so we can see, uh, here's the CIFAR results, right? So this is just the basic uh, supervised training followed by uh, using, say, the max logit as our anomaly score. And we're getting AUCs in the 0.77 range. If we use the same trained representation, but now use a supervised classifier, in this case, a thousand tree random forest that's given labeled anomalies and nominals, it can uh, get up to about 0 0.905, so gaining about 13 AUC points uh, just by using a better, an, a more informed anomaly scoring method. And if we train a classifier on uh, all 10 classes uh, and then ask how well it can do, it can get up to what, 0 0.987. Um, so uh, so the, the lesson there is that the latent space contains much more anomaly information than than is extractable using current anomaly scores. And probably that is extractable even by a linear uh, uh, 
uh, anomaly detector. Um, and, uh, and, and, and furthermore, there is additional headroom, particularly when there's a small number of training classes. One thing is that, that when you have a large number of training classes, of course, the problem itself gets harder, but the, but the amount of headroom and the gaps are, are smaller. So we have a, eight uh, uh, AUC points um, uh, if we just use an Oracle anomaly detector and, uh, and we get an additional two points if we can get a better representation. So the, there's a lot of, uh, so surprisingly, these latent representations learned during classification are quite good, uh, perhaps not as good as we would like them to be, but, but a lot better than, we, than they seem to be performing using our current anomaly scores. So are there ways we can extract improved anomaly scores by doing, for, instance, for example, density estimation? So one thing you can do is fit a multivariate Gauss into each of the known classes and use that as a mixture model for the probability density of, the, of all the known classes and then score the surprisal uh, uh, of, the, of the green points, basically, to, add, to ask, uh, you know, do they allow outside this or not? And um, this is very practical and works surprisingly well. There are some tricks because, of course, this is a, uh, uh, say, in this case, a 384-dimensional Gaussian. So uh, the covariance matrix may not be quite a full rank. So there are some tricks you need to, to do, but it's doable. And there was a nice paper uh, from Li, 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 and Shin 2018 where they showed uh, they fit uh, what they call the Mahalanobis distance method, which is they fit a single covariance matrix across all of the classes. Um, and then uh, are, they're able to use that. Since that's now constant, they can just compute the Mahalanobis distance between the z value of the query point and the means of each of the classes and, uh, and take the nearest class, distance to the nearest class as our anomaly score. And they get uh, significant improvements in performance on AUC, uh, big improvements on the true negative rate give at 95% true positive rate. So detecting 95% of the, of the anomalies and, uh, and, and uh, just raw classification accuracy actually increases as well. So um, I, I have a white lie warning here because the paper includes several other improvements. I just wanted this sort of clean case of fitting the Mahalanobis distance here. Um, another technique that's been applied is to uh, replace the softmax output with, uh, or the, the training target with some change uh, in the hopes that this helps us learn an improved representation. So uh, there's been work on label smoothing on something called geodin and something called isomax i. And let me talk about each of those. So label smoothing is an old idea from the 1990s that was reintroduced in the deep learning context by uh, Zigetti in 2015. And the idea is to use the standard softmax output layer, but instead of using the usual one hot targets, which is all zeros except for a one, a one, one for the target class, we instead are going to sort of steal probability mass alpha from that class and spread it uniformly across all the other classes. So now the other classes are trying to hit a target of alpha over k uh, for the incorrect answer and one minus alpha plus alpha over k for the correct answer. And a paper coming out of Toronto by Muller et al. Uh, shows that this causes the data points to form tighter clusters than we get if we use the one hot targets. And so with those tighter clusters now, it, it, it makes sense that we could fit better Gaussians to them and perhaps improve our anomaly scoring. Another idea <clears throat> that came out of the ODIN and then later this generalized ODIN or G-ODIN method um, from last year is to uh, compute the logit as the ratio of two learned functions. So the, the logit uh, activation for class K is going to be H sub K of Z divided by G of Z. Um, and uh, HK is a class specific uh, sort of strength function and G of Z is a, is a uh, instance specific uh, normalizer. And then they apply the softmax on top of this. And uh, surprisingly, although we haven't done a representational analysis of this, um, but we see experimentally that we're getting uh, significant improvements in AUC, uh, especially on CIFAR 100 using this technique. And uh, we've also seen nice improvements on uh, ImageNet 100. Uh, and the most recent one is from this year's Isomax I by Macedo and Ludimir. 
um, they learn a prototype for each class K in the latent space. So instead of fitting the mean of the latent space points, they learn a prototype point. And then they, um, they normalize the prototypes and the Z values by their norms so that they're now lying on a sphere. And then they calculate the logit for class K as a, uh, as a uh, parameter kappa that they set, a learned scaling parameter C, and then the distance, Euclidean distance measured in that normalized space. And, uh, and they again saw big improvements in AUC. Um, and uh, I believe this was also on CIFAR 10. And, uh, and improvements in the true negative rate while controlling uh, uh, by, by achieving a true positive rate of 95%. So very nice uh, performance there. And there have been several other proposals, right, for putting a Gaussian process as the final layer, a Dirichlet distribution instead of a categorical distribution. And, uh, and I think the open research question here is we need to compare the learned representations of these different methods to see how they're doing. The third method that's been approached in the deep learning community is hybrid methods. So the idea was to combine a supervised loss with an anomaly detection method, either supervised plus an autoencoder or supervised plus a deep density estimator. And so you have something that looks like this, where you have a, say, a ResNet 34 backbone, then you have the standard softmax classification head, and, but then also a decoder to a reconstruction head. And then you somehow balance the losses of these two errors with some magic parameter lambda and, uh, and then see how well this works. And, and, and uh, there are similar ideas that have been uh, implemented by, by other teams. In our work, uh, again, by my student Rishik Garapali, um, we, uh, we found that we used very different values of lambda. And in this case, we cheated and, and uh, we're finding the lambda that gave the best performance because again, we were kind of interested in, in a headroom analysis. So um, what we found was that this hybrid representation can really improve performance. Um, similar, uh, so, so very little improvement with the raw anomaly detector, but the Oracle can do much better. So somehow we are learning a better representation um, and, uh, and slightly better on the Oracle classifier. And those carry over to CIFAR 100 as well. So uh, another uh, example is, uh, is a hybrid network in which they're combining a classifier with the standard cross entropy loss with a flow-based density model. Now we're, we're calculating, they write this as log P of X, but it's really log P of Z, where Z is the, um, uh, the latent representation, right? Because uh, this is, we're starting with the latent representation here, which is a much more sensible idea. Um, and so they uh, are training they, uh, this, um, uh, using, uh, I think they were using GLOW, uh, another one of the flow-based methods, and, uh, and, and they, they also got good performance. Um, there are uh, other techniques that have been applied in a similar way. Um, but their results for open hybrid, um, uh, they, they were only reporting for AUC, but they, but they saw substantial, and they were in the out of distribution. Um, uh, no, 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 they're, they're in the open category setup. Um, they're, they're doing uh, quite well on, on these as well. Okay, and the, then the final method I want to talk about is instance contrastive learning uh, of the type that was uh, 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 made popular by Simclear. Um, the idea here is that you were going to do unsupervised training of the rep learning of the representation, um, right? And we start with a set of image transformations such as uh, rotation, scalings, clippings, uh, changes to the color map, um, uh, adding salt and pepper noise, you know, various kinds of transformations like that. And, uh, and there are two, two cases. In case one, we, we're, uh, we input the same image and we send it through the backbone twice. Once after being transformed by transformation one, which is sampled uh, you know, at random from this set uh, big T of transformations, and the second time with a different transformation. And they go through the backbone and we get the latent representations Z1 and Z2. And then they're sent through a projection network, which is a, just a multilayer perceptron, down to a lower dimensional space. And in this space, we apply cosine similarity as our loss. And, and in this case, because it's the same image transformed two different ways, we want to backpropagate to change the, uh, the weights in order to make these two representations more similar. 
And of course, by making U1 and U2 more similar, this will also act to make Z1 and Z2 more similar in, in, a, in a relevant way. Um, whereas if we take two different images, X1 and X2, and apply two transformations, uh, one to e each of them, push them through, now we want to um, decrease the cosine similarity between these two uh, uh, nodes. And you may ask, why do we have this projection network? Um, I think the idea was uh, that the cosine similarity works better in a lower dimensional space, but also um, uh, this kind of uh, mute, mutes a bit the impact of the cosine similarity on the latent representation. You know, we still retain uh, much higher dimensional information in the latent representation, and that may be useful both for classification and for anomaly detection by doing that. So uh, uh, what the SimClear team showed was that uh, if they use uh, large networks and train for a long time, like 900 epochs of this kind of uh, self-supervised training, and then learn a linear, uh, linear logits on top of it with a relatively modest amount of supervised data, they can match the performance of state-of-the-art supervised classifiers on the top one accuracy for ImageNet. So this is exciting. Um, it's very expensive. And so from my perspective, it's it's interesting primarily because it works at all, not because it's the right way to do ImageNet. Um, but of course, the, the claim is that it may be the right way to learn representations when we don't have labeled data. Well, um, it, there was a paper by Tack et al. Uh, that used uh, a, Sinclair, a variation on Sinclair to try to um, do anomaly detection. And, uh, and they did a T-SNE visualization of the final state of the learned representation. And they found much the same phenomenon that we saw earlier, which is that this was for a, a, a out of distribution uh, evaluation. So the in the known classes were all from CIFAR 10 and <clears throat> the out of distribution points were drawn from CIFAR 100. But the supervised learning or unsupervised learning have been done, self-supervised learning have been done on CIFAR 10. And we can see that uh, again, the uh, novel points are lying toward the center of the space whereas the ones we trained on are scattered out a lot more. Um, so um, uh, a, a nice piece of work that came out of Google by Winkins et al. Uh, applied then multivariate Gaussian scoring on top of Sinclair. Um, uh, and they used, uh, they combined both Sinclair and softmax with label smoothing. And they found that they got much better um, uh, uh, AUCs for the, uh, the out-of-distribution uh, uh, CIFAR 10 to CIFAR 100. Um, they also measured uh, uh, the effect of, of, of using their architecture, but with no contrastive training, so only supervised, and with no label smoothing, and so, showed that both of those made a big difference. And they also looked at, at controlling the, the true positive rate um, uh, and, uh, and saw that they could really drop their false positive rate uh, quite a lot, although 40% false positives is still uh, a pretty big number. Okay, well, um, so I guess the, the main lesson to take home from this discussion of deep anomaly detection is that we don't have uh, mature methods here. Uh, uh, that we also find that supervised training is, is surprisingly good just by itself, uh, but maybe these hybrid methods that combine a supervised head and some second task a self-supervised task or density estimation task uh, seem to give us some additional benefit. And for a purely self-supervised approach, I'd say uh, the jury is still out as to whether uh, that's going to be competitive uh, with these other methods. Especially, I think the challenge is when the number of classes gets very large. Um, it seems that a lot of the uh, tricks and techniques that the field has been exploring, maybe they don't pay off as much and maybe a fairly straightforward approach when you're training a classifier on 500 categories of objects, you're probably learning a pretty good representation. And so we need to be studying that as well. Okay, well, the final question I wanted to discuss is, uh, how can we set our anomaly detection threshold? In all the work we've been doing here, we've either been uh, uh, just set, uh, computing the AUC, which avoids the threshold, or we've been optimizing the threshold to, to measure, say, the true positive rate uh, or the false alarm rate at, at the given operating point. But how can we set it? Well, if we want to maximize our true alarm rate or true detection rate, true positive rate at a 5% false alarm rate, so we want to just control false alarms, 
then it's fairly straightforward. What we want to do is look at this black curve here. This is a, a, a kernel density estimator showing the anomaly scores on our known classes, right? So this is probability density, this is the anomaly score, and if we want to uh, have a 5% false alarm rate, we want to set our threshold tau here such that the area under this black curve is 5%. And then, because th that's where those will be our false alarms. And then our true alarms, right, will be the, just what's under the blue curve. The blue curve are, is the anomaly scores on our, uh, on our anomaly points, which we don't have. We don't know that blue curve, right? At the time, we have to choose tau. Unless we have a representative sample of labeled anomalies, uh, then, we can, then we can measure that blue curve. But in general, we don't have it, in, at least initially. Um, but if we want to do, uh, the, if we're more in the AI safety setting, where we want to, um, say, correctly classify, detect 95% of these anomalies or novel class objects, then we need to set our threshold here based on the, uh, the blue curve, such that there's, say, only 5% of the areas under this left tail. And to do that, we need to somehow estimate the blue curve. Well, if we don't have any data points, what can we do? Well, one possibility is we might have access to unlabeled data that is contaminated. So let's say that we have a training sample S0 of, of clean data from the nominal distribution. And then we have an unlabeled sample SM, which is a mixture with uh, uh, probability fraction one minus alpha are coming from the nominal distribution and some fraction, some proportion alpha are anomalies. So we're saying we have alpha uh, percent contamination in this mixture. Okay, and we'll come back to how we might know what alpha is, but, uh, but uh, if we assume we know alpha, then um, if we could compute the, um, the cumulative distribution function of the anomaly scores for the anomalies, uh, it would look like this, then we could set our threshold tau here to get, you know, 5%, uh, the 5% the quantile uh, of, of this uh, CDF instead of the PDF. Uh, um, and so that's what we would like to do. But of course, we don't have the CDF for the anomaly scores either. Um, but uh, but the, if the, if the uh, densities are, are a mixture, then the, the CDFs are also a mixture. And if the CDFs are a mixture, then we can do some uh, little algebra here, and we can solve for the anomaly CDF uh, by subtracting the, uh, the mixture and the nominal and dividing by alpha. So ideally, we'd have a picture that looks like this. We estimate F0 and FM from our two samples, S0 and SM, plug them in here, and we get out FA. Reality, unfortunately, looks like this, at least for a small sample. I chose a particularly bad looking one. But we can see that our empirical CDFs for, for the anomaly scores for F0 and for FM are beautiful you know, uh, uh, empirical CDFs. They're step functions, but, they, but they're monotonically increasing. They start at zero, they end at one. But, the, but when we subtract them, we get a mess, right? This uh, is not increasing monotonically, it goes negative. It does start at zero and end at one. <laughs> But, uh, but what can we do? Um, well, what we're going to use is actually, uh, we're, if we're interested in like the, the five percentile here, we will use the rightmost crossing of this uh, to set our threshold tau, because that's the safe choice. Fortunately, the real uh, case looks a bit like this, although if you zoom in, you still might have multiple crossings here, but we're gonna use the rightmost edge. And then we can prove a theorem uh, in the pack style that says, um, if we have this amount of training data, then with probability one minus delta, we will have an alien detection rate of at least one minus Q plus epsilon. So epsilon is our kind of error approximation parameter, and it enters here as a one over epsilon squared, which is the typical thing you see in uh, these kind of concentration bound based methods. Um, and alpha also appears here uh, basically as one over alpha squared. Um, so as alpha gets tiny and as epsilon gets tiny, our, our required sample size gets very large. Uh, and this makes sense because when alpha is very small, we actually have very few anomalies in that mixture distribution. So the sample size needs to grow, get big enough so that we can actually get enough anomalies uh, effectively to, to measure uh, FA. 
So if, uh, what about estimating alpha? How can we figure out what alpha is? Well, uh, from a strict uh, point of view, it is not identifiable in general. But under reasonable assumptions, we can obtain a pretty good estimate. And this was an experiment where we compared uh, uh, five different estimates from the literature with the ground truth. So the, the truth is this uh, pink line here. And we can see that this orange line here, which is uh, from a paper by Patra and Sen 2016, is giving uh, quite decent performance. Doesn't do too well in this one letter recognition data set, but it's doing quite well on the others. So uh, my student, Su Liu, led this work along with uh, Rashid Garapali, Devashas Mundal, and myself, and, uh, and we have a paper under review. So let me wrap up this entire presentation by reviewing what I covered. So first we talked about the sort of main families of anomaly detection methods, distance-based methods, density methods, density quantile estimation, and then reconstruction error. And then we switched and looked at uh, deep learning from the point of view of learning a good representation in which we could use distance or density estimation or density quantile estimation um, or possibly reconstruction. And, uh, and we compared, basically, we showed that supervised classification with softmax is already not terrible, uh, although there is a lot of headroom for extracting the anomaly score uh, better than, than just using the logits. Um, we saw that uh, you can gain some improvements by changing the final layer to, to not be just the standard softmax. Um, we saw that we could also gain improvements by using a hybrid, a two-headed network, where we combine supervised classification with one of these anomaly detection losses, say density estimation or distances or reconstruction. And then the most speculative technique is instance contrastive learning. And, uh, and we show that it, while it shows some promise, it also appears to show the same weaknesses as supervised classification in that the uh, anomaly points uh, are not given distinct representations, uh, at least compared to the, to the nominal points. So I think there are many open research questions here. This is not by any means a finished topic. Um, we really need to understand what's going on in representation learning. Can we come up with improved methods that give us representations that represent uh, a, a space that, is, uh, that goes beyond just our training data? Can we extrapolate the representation? Um, and then we need methods for comparing these learned representations to study them and, and uh, and, I, and it would be particularly wonderful if we could have an open framework where we could do control the comparisons of these methods. Because as you can see, uh, I couldn't build you just one table showing the comparison of all these methods because everyone is using different setups um, and, uh, and some are using the OOD setting, some are using the, uh, uh, the open category setting. And if we can get all that working, there are still many other questions. For instance, how can we explain the anomalies we find to users? or to subject matter experts. We say, well, this case looks weird. Figure, you figure out why. We want to say, here's why we think it's unusual. And if we can get feedback from users uh, in previous work at Oregon State um, by Amran Siddiqui, uh, he showed in his thesis that uh, incorporating user feedback in, uh, online into the anomaly detection procedure can be extremely powerful in improving our uh, true positive rates. Uh, and reducing our false alarm rates. And of course, if we are discovering new categories, we should be learning definitions for them, say, with few shot learning and incorporating them into the classifier. But few shot learning has uh, basically the same representational needs as anomaly detection. These new points should, should be meaningfully separated from the, the previously known classes. Well, I'll stop here and conclude in the slides. I have uh, the bibliography for uh, all the things that I cited here. Uh, and I'm eager to, uh, to hear your reactions. You can reach me on Twitter as at tdietrich or my email is tgd at cs.orst.edu.